Greetings to you all. Welcome to the Green Mealy production webinar being hosted by CITCO Zimbabwe. Today, we want to discuss at great length how you can increase crop production in green mealy production. So it's important for us to take note of the key issues that are associated with the production as well as the marketing of green mealies. At this point, I'm going to share the screen. In green mealy production, it's important for us to take note of the windows that we can create, we can produce our green mealies for them to be profitable, as well as the variety selection and good agronomic practices, as well as marketing tips that are going to make us more profitable and get more returns per dollar invested in terms of the green mealy venture. So some, for some housekeeping issues as we start the presentation, this presentation will run for one hour it is live on Facebook as well. So I encourage others, tell someone to tell someone that there is a Green Mealy Production webinar underway and they need to join it. The presentation is also being recorded and it will be shared on YouTube after. We have a PowerPoint presentation which we are currently beaming on the screen and it will be beamed during the course of the presentation. Typed questions are invited in our chat box and answers will be provided. We also have an exciting array of video clips that we took from the market that we are going to be sharing with you for you to get an appreciation of what happens in the marketing of green millies. Now for the objectives of the webinar. Why green milli production? For anything, for any cropping venture, you need to understand why it is profitable to do it. And also you need to understand the profitability, the profit story that is associated with it. Because nowadays, there is, uh, there is a talk of farming being more of a business than an extracurricular activity. So you need to make sure that you are investing well in your business for you to get high returns. You also need to understand the essential elements of crop production because the understanding of this will lay a firm foundation for us to do the right things, for us to optimize on productivity. Good agronomic practices are the glue or the joining points for us to unlock the genetic potential in the established crops that we will have grown and the good genetics that will be at play. We also need to understand the planting tips because if you fail to plant on time and you plant wrongly, it means that you fail to get the desired results and you'll be found wanting. We'll then move on to discuss the topic of the day, variety selection, because it boils down to the choice of variety that you make, whether or not it's going to be profitable, desired by the market, or give you the desired characteristics so variety selection is what we're also going to dwell on. We're also going to, we're also going to discuss the new CITCO genetics that have been released this year because at CITCO, we believe in continuously improving and moving forward, moving with the times and embracing climate change by bringing on board climate smart varieties that speak to what is happening globally. So it's important for us to take note of the new genetics that are coming on board after which we'll round up by giving you a tech warm pack and we'll invite questions and we'll be providing answers to the questions that you will have provided earlier on. So why green mealy production? Green mealy production is important in the sense that green mealies can act as a cash crop. It is a high return on investment or return per dollar invested and it enhances cash flows on a farm. One of the things that farmers fear most is having to get to a point where they are failing to produce enough to pay wages on the farm or for the running costs. So Green Millies provides a window for you to establish a crop where you can find uh, cash flows for you to then be running your farm optimally and get good returns as well as uh, to safeguard the growth of your enterprise. It also increases income streams by having multiple crops Annually, if irrigation allows, it also allows you to then come in with a regular cash flows and income streams, and it doesn't put you in strains of credit 
because you are, are constantly knocking on doors to look for credit facilities, you then, you, you then be able to run a sustainable farming enterprise. Green millage is also quite healthy in the sense that it is high fiber content, which is desired in the dietary um, content of our food, uh, given that nowadays there's talk of, of uh, us moving towards being more health conscious. So green millage is one of the healthy options. It also gives us effective land utilization where it promotes double cropping. And in some instances where the weather allows and in frost free areas, you can even have multiple cropping and, having, and have farmers doing three crops uh, annually. This will also increase on their income streams. It also promotes an opportunity for green milli production where you find that some areas like the low belt and areas that are not prone to frost can also establish a green milli crop during the winter period. Suffice to say that this year, the winter was a bit harsh, especially in the July month, but we find that uh, in our visits, particularly to the markets, and especially yesterday, when we visited Mbare Musika in Harare, we found that there is green mealy, which is being sold on the market, which is to say that there are some farmers who produced that green mealy crop during that time when it was challenging for it to be produced, which gives them a selling advantage because their supply at this time is lower than the demand. So this, uh, this green mealy crop is going to fetch a higher return and it's going to fetch good money on the market. It also creates employment. One of the other things that is feared most by farmers on the farm is the fact that if, there is, um, if the workforce is idle for a given period, it promotes theft, it promotes different things that are not desired on the farm. And some of them might get into other activities that um, might be done in that area, like mining, like um, um, the picking of fruits and all these other activities that might distract them in their day-to-day -day activities and distract the running of the farm. So it's important for us to create employment for our workforce on a regular basis by engaging and doing all these enterprises that promote multiple cropping at a given time, given that irrigation will be allowing. So at this point, before we walk the profit story and talk about profitability, would like to hear from the markets. Because for anything to be profitable, to be successful, you need to understand the market forces that drive it. So for us, we found it prudent for us to go to Mbarimsika and interview some of the farmers who were there selling their produce, as well as the, the middlemen, the buyers, and the people selling the produce on the market at Mbarimsika. So this is what they had to say about the profitability of green milli production. So I would just like to highlight that after sharing this clip, I'll come in with an interpretation in English of what has been said by the farmers in Bari. So I'll stop sharing at this point. Mangwana ni akana kakudai, tiliku musika mukuru we Mbari, muarare. Takatari sana na wari mi barukulima chibake cha sitko, Inova, che yellow, nature white. Tina Mr. Home and Asma Gana Nakadai, Banuba, Kum Toko, Tunakum Goku to Chibagi, Chekenya, Chinibaga Chawaiti, Chakawa Nakiri, Kuma farmers, our Nayo Zekari, Mr. Home, Takumi Kumutu Ziso, I'm sorry, Peshbag, Chakana Kiri. I'm the only judge, you know, Tapira. I was the test. You know, Perekawana, you know, Gaga good. Kanata got ten such a garam of Pera Mongotong, which tens of the same price. So, Tinochi did a baggage. Tinochi baggage, Chena. Chanda on a footage, I'm going to take such a carry. I see any man or email footy, you know, from company at Sitco. The AP in Bewi, I'm got two that you call them the Gurea Kakurasi, two Zev in Bewi in the AP, my farmers one eight dinner cheese a carry, two Zem, Mr. Home. Two far as seven, two seven. Tototi Casa, no Tototi Casa Banana. Don't be too far and don't be too far. I'm a customer. You know, Tapira, I have to take the wrong far and the challenge. Taka Tarisa na Mr. Omwe, Maka Bata Shiba Gezao. Mr. Omwe, Taina Kuzot from Bewu Zamaka Bata Itu. Mbewu Yirikuru Ujgi, Mbewu Yirikuru Boshke, Mbewu Ipi, Taurea Yeah, Yalo, 608. 608. E, 727. But, you know, Kurab Darika, 
Unarika hii. Kutongo chibage hii chasaru kwa hii. Time zaenda. Chino kura kita za uombe kuna hii. Dosa atifari rambeo zipu. Izo zizi. Paguri ma. Ima 90 days. Kuiba kwa zombe wizi. Hazineta kuiba. Hazina. Shaka wanda shotino poda hizi. Misi omwe. Chino ziwa kwa nge uchuona fama. Achirai za kuti. Ani mbeo zake zaka shika si za muna ato. Pani nge pachirai za watipane good management. Ininge ya kait kwa. Munga tu uze rukuti pa good management ya makaita ini briefi maka rimarini maka sanga ane goyere uye chaka kana maka sanga anaro mune mshu nga wa maka spray ya ere sulubuka misi ome kutawari ya mafama zi Pambe wizi zika zirima april mana april ibotaka zirima haa mshu nga wa 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 nga Ndiyo bana nyaya. Chona kudiridza. Kare zvino mangwana na kana kakudaita Tarisara na Mr Murewa. Anova ndiye mutengesi wechibage chinenge chabva kuna ma pharmacy anenga achiri manao. Mr Murewa, taida kuti musununguke muchitsana kura zvino mangwana na kana kakudai kuti chibage ichi chine mari here chinokupa i profit here chi chinoitika pakutengesa chibage mangwana nikudai. Mamuka se, mamuka se, ini ni ndi nonzi wa murewa. Ino kuru zira wa rimi, kuti wa ndiri miro chibake, ichi shinonzi mbeu yedu ye CS608. Ne kuti mbeu ii, ya kati nakira pa kuti, haikurumi ze kushawa. Ino gara, kwenguwa ya kati rebei, uye ine kutapira kwa inako, kwa ineita, uye uka yisa pa kugocha. Ino kurumi ze kuhiva. Taka uya pa utano, tinezwa tinoana mairi. Even tikataza kuitengesa kilichi nyoro, tikachuomesa, tinendesa, kuno chigaisa, tono panguruwe, kana kuno pa huku. Izu sinu wakuti, tinengeta wana, goredu, rakanaka, paku kwa chibake, chedu chembewe, ya kata eche elu. Ndocha chinonye ya kufara, pari pa kutengesa, watengi vedu, wanufara kutichinenga chine mguri wakakura, chaka guta, uye chaka shinga, pa kukura kwacho. Watengi vedu ndoza wanonye ya kufari ila izozo. Tuna kumgizi sa kuti, wari kutengesa sei chipake chao kumafama zao, wari kutengesa mawonu wanere kwa wari kutengesa hali majazins. Shichizo wapa profitere, Mr. Murewa, sinungu kai taurea ya makastoma zengi. Imbeo hii tinaifara kunyanya nyanya kungwe chando. Nekuti ino wa kukura kwa kanaka. Nyanya kurowa ni chando za kanyanya. Ndokuwa saka ya kakurowa kutaiso. Asi isu karataa kutengesa pa musika. Tinotangira kutengesa 83 dollars a dozen. Dozen iredu. Nenge tine zibake tuko rufu. Saka na iso ozo tinenge tichiti 3 dollars. Tika tichasaru tuwe saru tuwe chasara mzuri nenge midiki. Ndwe patino kwansa kuziki siru wa tenge wedu. Manenga wajino zono tenge sewe kumarogesheni. Toshiko pa mtengo kutano kwansa kubadara. Uno wa watawe kuita iyo zino. Tatanga tichiti thiri. Ezo ezo za kuita two dollars. Ndata asai muru kuwana wano kwa umu kana kutai. Nekufara kuti ichi chibake wajikaji. Nyango kwa itamazo. Wama hiri usina kuchitengeza. Lechitatu rajo chilenge chichungo refresh. Chichingo tapira, achikunu mize kuru za testi. Mbede nzoo higai, kunzi nzoo, kukura kwayo, kukura kwa tsanga. Ndoe ya kanyanya kukura pa chibagaji. Uye chibagaji kaji, chino tapira. Uye ichi chibagi kaji, chino toranguwa ya kati mazo wa matatu kana mana. Chichingo refresh satcharu za testi. Ichi chibagaji, chino kura jipa mguri wacho, pa tsanga. Zinenge zaka guta. Kweta chiguri chacho chinenge chiri chidiki. Asi tsanga. Zinenge ziri ombe. Tinotengeza eti. Two dollars. Ziri eti. Zasia na neche yelu. Kuti chinenge chiti. Two dollars. Ziri tuko roof. Ichinenge ta kuti two dollars. Ziri eti. Saka zino titra uti. Isuzu pa kutengeza kwe duka. Tinenge tichipusho ma volumes. Akati kuti. Nekuda kwe kuti wana anufaroji. Pake zi ombe. Anengo zaza four. Anengo zaza potu. Zino da kukwa kuti. Mageta kane nga mkumbini za uti shikuru za chikuhifa. Achiri mangwangwa ni zakare, tiri mumumbare mumusika zakare, mkotiora here are. Tirikusanga na futi na mai gandhi, wakipa pamurewa zakare. Sinurada uti murewa ini nge nuwa nipa chibake jivano shida zikuru. Mai gandhi, tukana ngureo kuti, chino nye kudikama, 
kwa mafarmers yenyewe wamotengesa na chibage mchigocha chi pa chibage chenyu che Kenya ni chibage chenyu che white sunungu ka itaurira ina wali menyu pa chibage chedu za tinoda chibage chedu chinofano wakunge chaka batana hachifano wakunge chaka taramukana chinofano wakunge chichipenyera chine tsanga hombe uye chaka naka chino tapira chibage chedu cha chinofano wakugocha ndo kutichifarirwe uye zepade cha tinobika Chino fano honge chibage chine matanga mahombe. Chiri chaka chaka yeweza. Muguru wacha ono fano wakunge waka kura. Usu na kutetepa waka kora. Achifano honge chaka jigwane mbewa. Nekunge chaka jigwane shiri. Chibage chadu chino fano honge chaka naka. Chino chino tapira chibage chadu robika. Because chibage chadu chino fano wakunge. Chisi naka na kuta. Pame pacha ushu. Chimwe chisi na kuta matarangano. Chino fano honge chaka batana. Chibage chadu chatinoda. Tiri kuda kuzisai sisi kutiyo waka suni kuka kudai. Wewe mbeu idzi pa pambeu zawa zawa kuhu tarsa na zo zinawa shumba nenzo. Wani makore akare ba zagadi mbeu idzi ziri zee kampani ipi. Ah tato ne makore akawanda. Aguda kutoshiga kana ten years. Tino fara zo shumba. Do mbeu ino titi ra. Ende ino ita wana wa umbe. Mukuru wacha unenge waka kora Ino yeweza Kana Wabele kwa wanofara kutenga mbe uyoza kanyanya Kunyangwe kana Tika gocha Chino toone kakuti ndicho shisha tari maichi Nekuti atiso rume mguri Asukuti tino rume chibage Atu rume mguri Tino rume chibage Dombe uya tino fara shumba nenzo uyi Yesitko Mashoka kana kawaru kutoro Nanti karachi yambe uze sitko Haturumi mukuri hadi chiruru machibake kuri vati vari kunakirwa kuti mbeu idzi dzine tsanga dzaka uanda dzakakura isine kuti dzine muguri mudiki pakati pao wow what a powerful set of testimonies we have got from the mbare musika farmers as well as the marketers at that market so it's important for us to always uh, make sure that we also align to the market forces and understand what the market desires for us to be profitable and to be doing the right thing. So as I share my screen to discuss the profit story, I would like just to summarize the discussion which was being heard at Mbare Msika. So yesterday when we visited Mbare Msika, Mr. Womwe had a discussion with uh, seed course agronomist for Harare, uh, Mr. Stuart Zura, He's the one who was interviewing the farmers as well as the market people in Barim Sika. And the discussion with Mr. Wome, who was the first speaker, was around the issues to do with the selection of varieties, the varieties that farmers prefer at Barim Sika. So there we heard that the farmers prefer varieties that are sweet, that have a long shelf life, and a good, that fetch a good price. And he mentioned there, Mr. Wome mentioned that 727 and 608 the favorites amongst the varieties that farmers uh, were buying. And you also mentioned issues to do with the days to green mealy maturity, not physiological maturity, which you mentioned that it ranges between 90 to about 110 days, which is the window in which you are at the milk door stage desired by most farmers or most consumers or customers to be buying their green mealy crop. He went on to give us a brief synopsis of the management that he employed, where he mentioned that planting of this green mealy crop in Mutoko was done in April, and water is a critical element required for green mealy production, seeing as it's done at a time when the season is when, when we are not in the rainy season, so irrigation is also quite important. He also mentioned that scouting is important for you to come in with time years control of insect pests, and they came in to spray at, at intervals when it was desired, but because of the winter period, the challenges that they faced were not as high as the challenges that are predominantly faced in the summer period. After which we heard from Mr. Murewa. Mr. Murewa is a buyer or a person who sells this, uh, these green millies at Mbare Msika. So he mentioned issues to do with the varieties being preferred by our farmers, particularly giving emphasis to 608, having a health benefit because it has um, uh, a protein content which is high, and the profitability as well of doing this. He spoke about issues to do with selling at uh, a dollar. So um, at, when they are selling a dozen of cobs, they start by selling, given uh, looking at the size of the cobs, where extra large sized cobs 
they can fetch three dollars per dozen and they will come down to around two dollars when they are medium to small size cobs so this gives a good profit as you are going to see when we discuss the profit, so the profit story he also mentioned that even if the grain reaches a period when it dries off especially looking at the yellow maize it is also good for stock feeds so he mentioned that it can also be processed as, as a, a, a processed as grain and farmers can use it for stock feed. He went on to mention that for SC727 at Parem Siga, they call it Casa Banana because it produces an extra large sized cob, which is desired. But the size of the cob, it, it gives them a great selling advantage because they'll sell less cobs for a dollar as compared to the medium to the small sized cobs of the other varieties. So 727 is a variety of choice. Uh, 600, the 600 series varieties, the medium maturity ones, there are also varieties of choice, and we are going to get into this discussion as we move the presentation. We also heard from Mai Gandhi. Mai Gandhi, when she mentioned that she's a farmer from Umrewa, but she mentioned that issues to do with deep kennel sets are important in green millies, where the area that is covered by the grain should be larger than the core area or the cob, which we say and refer to as the shelling out percentage. This is also important in green mealy production. She also mentioned that farmers also like shiny uh, grain when, uh, when, when it has been roasted. She, uh, she mentioned that farmers like cobs that are great, that have good uh, roasting qualities like the yellow maize, as well as the 727 and the other varieties you get from Citco, like the 659. So she also went on to mention issues to do with the days, the maturity and the shelf life. And she mentioned that even for cooking, the softness of the green mealy is also quite important. So farmers should also take note of that. Let me add that we want to now move on to the profit story, as we have already seen. Now let's discuss it at greater length. So the profitability of green millies, the profitability of green millies is hinged about, is hinged upon one's understanding of the gross margin principles where you need to understand that for every dollar you are investing in any cropping venture, how much are you getting out of it? A profit and loss analysis. Where we are saying, gone are the days when we just produced, just willy-nilly, not taking into account the cost of production as well as the output that we are getting. So for every dollar invested, you can get between $2 to $3 for every dollar invested, provided that good agronomic practices have been employed in the production of the green mealy crop. The cost of production can range between uh, 800 US dollars to 1,000 US dollars per hectare. At the, at, on this cost, we are looking at the total variable cost, which include the seed, the fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation costs, labor costs, and other costs included there. So the encouragement that we want to give our farmers is that when you are doing green millies, you need to aim to get between 3,000 to 3,500 dozens of green millies per hectare, which you will be able to sell. This will give you good returns, but this should be sizable cobs, where you need to take note of the population, as you will see when we move to the agronomic practices that we promote. And we also see that one dozen can fetch between a dollar to a dollar fifty. So here we are being conservative, as you have heard, from the Mbarem Sika team, where at this time, they are fetching between $2 to $3 because of the selling window that they have managed to get into, as well as the demand and supply matrix, which promotes the sale of the green mealy crop at a time when most people do not have a crop on the market. So now they are fetching between $2 to $3 per dozen, depending on number one, the size of the crops, number two, the time they are selling, as well as the variety that they will have selected. So it's also important to stagger your crop when you are planting, depending on the scale of production you are doing. Suffice to say that for green millies, you don't need to have a large head trade. Even a small block is good enough for green millies. And you can stagger at a quarter hectare or small little blocks that you can do in your farm of different varieties or different planting dates so that you'll be harvesting for a longer window. It gives you as well a longer selling window, which is desired by most markets. And as you can see there on the pictures, you're seeing that the lady in the blue jacket, she is carrying a sack of uh, green millies. 
that showing that she has already bought for resale. So it's also a, a, a market that is quite uh, promising and you can get into at different um, levels and become profitable. So it's important to take note of the profit story in any cropping venture for you to remain viable and for you to grow in your business enterprise. And the two-time president, Akwinumi Adesina, says, and I quote, the next generation of billionaires in Africa will be farmers. So why not? As farmers, it's upon us. The impetus is upon us to jump on board and embrace farming as a formidable business. So with that in mind, with the profitability story lingering in our mind, let's discuss the essential crop production principles that you need to look at. Number one, you need to look at the genetics. Genetics are important because they give you the desired traits that we were mentioning, the cob size, the taste, the sweetness, as well as the shininess of the cobs, deep seated, seated kennels. This all speaks to issues to do with variety selection. So it's also important and it plays a pivotal role. But outside of that, good agronomic practices also come into play. This includes the, the, our treatment of the soil. The soil is one of the main foundations and the source in which most of our crops are being grown. It's the main growing media. So it's important for us to take note and to safeguard, protect, and nurture our soil for it to be able to avail the needed nutrients as well as the moisture requirements of the crop for it to grow well. Then outside of that, we look at management. Before we go to the management, however, issues to do with the weather, the climate, they play a pivotal role where you need to take note of the time when you are producing your crop. If you are doing your green mealy crop, now when there is no, when chances are quite slim to none of you getting an overlap of the rainy season on your crop of green millies, it means you have to have enough water to irrigate that crop from establishment right through to green mealy maturity. Where we are saying here, it's important for you to understand the dynamics that come with the requirements, irrigation requirements of the crop irrigation scheduling, soil type, water holding capacity, all that comes into play. So you need to take note of the weather elements, as well as the heat units, whereby the heat units, now we are seeing that with the effect from the 1st of August, we saw a significant shift in the temperatures. Heat units are starting to pick up. So these heat units have a direct relationship on the growth rate, the rate of growth of the crop. And this will also affect the date to maturity and the selling window which you are going to be targeting. So the heat units will also differ depending on, the, on your agroecological region, which you can also get a full understanding of by having interactions and engagements with CITCO agronomists who are scattered around the country in every province to add value in your farming enterprise. Then we move on to the management. The management is the glue that cements all these factors together. Where you find that farmers can get the same implement, the same tools, under the same conditions in the same agroecological region, but still they produce different results. Why? It, it now boils down to the management level that they are employing on their farm. You need to embrace a hands-on approach. You need to be thorough. You need to take farming as a business, not as an extra curricular, extra activity that you do as a hobby so that it becomes profitable. So these are some of the profitable elements and production elements that you need to look at for you to become viable. So we'll start by dwelling much on the agronomic practices as we narrow down to the issue of the day when we speak about the genetics. So looking at the good agronomic practices, good agronomic practices, common as this term may be, and as much as we speak about it frequently, you might find that most might fail to understand that this is a blanket term that encompasses a lot of subsectors that include soil type, fertility, weed management, insect pests, diseases, variety selection, um, uh, the weather, these all contribute to the yield. So the good agronomic practices are what is going to unlock the genetic potential in the varieties in question. So now looking at uh, the time of planting, it's important for us to take note of the time that is recommended for us to plant any crop for it to be profitable. So for green millies, we find that Issues to do with frost avoidance are what gives a, a selling advantage to those farmers who have a crop at this time, because they managed to establish a crop in a period when other farmers were facing challenges with frost or challenges 
with the risk of frost where they even failed to establish the crop to begin with. So crop damage at early stages can occur at late stages due to frost. And we saw that there was a significant number of farmers who were affected by the frost, especially this year. However, some farmers made, managed to safeguard their crop, mitigate the risk of frost, and have a crop to sell at this time. So suffice to say that for most areas, we are out of the frost threatening window. And we have now entered a period when all farmers with irrigation wanting to establish a green milk crop can safely do so. Hence this timeless webinar that we feel that we, we should discuss about issues to do with this profitable crop in season. So floral sterility at critical stages occurred for those farmers who, were, who managed to establish during the, the frost period, but some farmers also managed to harvest, like we've rightfully said, and also unsizable uh, small cobs for some farmers. But still you find that because supply is low, the demand is high. So even those small cobs are going to fetch much on the market. Suffice to say that small cobs also have a, a relationship with the variety selection, as well as the management of the crop. Because if you manage your crop well, give it the desired nutrient requirements, you should get sizable cobs that are sellable for green millets, especially if you choose and start with the right seed. So the right sowing time will give you the right selling window. After the frost occurs, like now, for the areas, such as the high veld, the middle veld, you need to establish now in August. This is the time when you should be establishing your green mealy crop. And in the lower veld, you also find that throughout the year, they manage to establish their crop uh, because during the winter months, they also experience relatively favorable heat units that can encourage them to establish a green mealy crop even in winter. And we, are, we were hearing when we were in Bari that uh, even the farmers from Umutoko, from Umurewa, most of them managed to establish a green mealy crop which is now at a stage when they are selling. But there are pockets still in those areas that were affected by frost. So it's not a one size fits all situation. So now we want to discuss issues to do with planting. So when you're planting any crop, land preparation is important. But if you look at issues to do with your land preparation, it, it enables the crop to grow optimally, extract the desired nutrients, extract the desired moisture, from the soil and grow and give you the desired sizable crops for green mealy production. So in land preparation, we talk mostly of two broad factors, conventional and conservation tillage practices. Where in conventional tillage, this is the norm for most farmers, where it has been done over the years extensively to an extent that we now understand it to its fullest. So it's important for us to embrace new farming technologies that come on board because they also come with added advantages that are meant to safeguard number one, our environment, and number two, to add value on our pockets by creating a relationship between the environment and the crops that add value to the soil organic matter. So conventional tillage farmers can come in with thorough land preparation where they turn over the soil. They come in with implements that are going to pulverize the soil, turning it over with a plow, with the reaper, with the chisel plow, then they follow, follow, follow through with the disc, then they come in with a roller, which is to say that there are multiple uh, implements that go into that uh, uh, practice of conservation or of conventional tillage to break the crust, break the plow pen, and some farmers are still doing so. But we want to encourage conservation farming, where we speak mostly to three principles, minimum soil disturbance, permanent ground cover, as well as crop rotation. So these are the three principles that guide conservation farming. So when you are embarking on conservation farming, it's not enough for you to take, to take one facet or one principle and ignore the others. What does it help for you to do rotations and constantly come in to turn over your soil, pulverize it, leaving it exposed for erosion? If you embark on conservation, the three principles should apply, which is why the, con the concept of kumbuza in Twasa Gachompo comes into play where farmers are encouraged to then minimize soil disturbance and just dig where they want to establish their crop. So on those kumbuza plots, on those kumbuza holes, you can still come in and dig your hole, put your fertilizer, your soil conditioner, put it mix a bit and then come in with the seed when you're planting. This can be encouraged as long as you have the irrigation to support your crop. The important thing is to take note of the fact that our seed needs to have a fine 
till our ground needs to have a fine till for there to be good seed to soil conduct, which then promotes good germination, crop establishment, as well as a good crop stand to give us optimum yields. So optimum plant populations for green millet. This will differ slightly as you are, uh, you can see from the screen, 40,000 to 44,000 plants per hectare is what we encourage. Yes, some farmers may go as high as 48,000 plants, but this will compromise on the size of the cobs that you're going to get. Where in green milli production, it's not just about the grain that you're going to get ultimately, because you're not going to get to physiological maturity. Rather, it's about the size of cobs that you're going to produce, because the window for green milli selling is not wide. So you need to optimize that selling window by having sizable cobs that are desired by the market, because there will also be competition of farmers selling their produce on the market. You want your produce to be picked first. So make sure that you adhere to the recommended plant population. So for you to get a population of 40,000 to 44,000 plants per hectare, you need to factor in a three to 5% factor for field losses, where if you plant at around 44,000, you might get plus or minus 43, 42,000, depending on the field losses that you incur. So it's important, even as you plan for summer, when you plant, factor in the three to 5% for field losses that might occur in the field. So for you to get this desired plant population, you need to get an interrow spacing of um, 75 to 90 centimeters, an interrow spacing of 25 to 30 centimeters. Then comes the question of those farmers who want to do two pips per planting station. What it means is, you might choose to maintain your interrow spacing, which is the spacing from one line to the next, but you need to adjust your in-row spacing, the spacing from one plant station to the next, so that you get the desired plant population of 44,000 plants per hectare. Some farmers may do 75 by 40 centimeters to achieve two pips per planting station and adjust accordingly on the fertilizers so that you don't stress the crop having to share the fertilizers that were meant for one pip or one seed to be shared amongst two seeds because that is divided attention that we do not want in our crop. So the seed rate is 25 kgs per hectare, but we do have pegs at Sitco where we sell 50,000 kennel pegs that can also be enough for you to do a hectare. As you rightfully see there for green millies, 40,000 to 44,000 plants. So a 50,000 kennel peg is enough and with an extra for you to establish a hectare. The other important thing that you need to take note of when you're establishing green millies is the fact that you need to use seed dressing. Why seed dressing? Yes, our varieties that we breed are tolerant to maize streak virus. And some of them are also quite tolerant to the an extent that it will not come in. But it's important for us to understand the time, the window we are growing our green millies. It's a time when the incidence of maize streak is high. So we also recommend for you to use um, seed dressing chemicals like imidacloprid, giving the active ingredient name there. It might come in different trade names and you can engage agrochemical specialists for other options of seed treatment that are available on the market. So the important thing is to start on time, start right and start with the right seed. So moving on to the fertilizers, you need to take note of the fertilizer that you are putting into place uh, in terms of your cropping. You need to choose your fertilizers wisely, but be guided by soil analysis. We always emphasize the importance of soil analysis and soil conditioning on time, because this speaks to your ability to get maximum fertilizer use efficiency. So this is important. So the basal fertilizer can range between 300 to 400 kg per hectare. This is a general recommendation, knowing rightfully so that those who are, we have fans with them, serious farmers, they have taken note of this range, but we want to encourage you and emphasize that you need to do soil analysis for you to farm profitably. So the macro elements, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash are what you need to look at. For basal fertilizers, don't buy basal fertilizers based on their trade names. Rather, understand and know the actual elements that are in the fertilizer, the NPK ratio, what you are providing to your crop, because this is what the crop desires. Is it getting it? So you need to make sure of that by understanding the fertilizer. In terms of top dressing, we need to apply the top dressing fertilizers at optimum rates at the right time and understand the dynamics that come with the top dressing fertilizer in question. For top dressing fertilizer, the general recommendation is 350 to 400 kgs per hectare. For AN or urea, 
depending on your soil type, soil analysis results, as well as the previous cropping history, where farmers who might have done tobacco, potato, farmers who might have done crops that are heavy feeders or nitrogen fixing crops like legumes, such as uh, your, your soya bean, they have also residual nitrogen in their soil. But we don't want to have generalized recommendations based on the visualization of our, our fields. Rather, soil analysis should guide us at all times. So when you're using AN, you need to understand that split applications are recommended, especially for soils that are sandy because of the leaching effects that come with, uh, with AN, ammonium nitrate, which is a 34.5% uh, nitrogen content. Then with urea, which is a 46% nitrogen content, it volatilizes into the atmosphere. So this is uh, being taken into the atmosphere, it vaporizes. So this is important for us to take note of, and we need to safeguard against this. If we are using urea, we need to cover it slightly so that there is no risk for volatilization in our fields, as well as to understand that urea would desire uh, conditions that are very moist to swampy, and uh, you, do, you don't want to stress your crop by introducing a nitrogenous fertilizer when you do not have irrigation in place or when you plan to come and irrigate after a couple of days. Make sure irrigation and a nitrogenous fertilizer application move hand in glove. So this is just a summary of the planting tips where here we can see that that is the land preparation underway. This was done today, this morning, where we had visited a farmer who was planting their green millet crop. And we are seeing that the land preparation choice there is conventional. They came in with a plow, disked their land, then they rolled it to produce a fine tilt. Then they were coming in with rolling out because of the block size. And then they also came in with the fertilizer application with the cup, with the cup will give them a standard application of eight grams, but you need to be guided every time for fertilizer with soil analysis. Then they also came in with the right seed, which we are seeing there, a pack of SC529 and early maturing variety, which was being applied and planted there at that field. So at this point, we want to discuss weed management as we move to discuss issues to do with variety selection in the interest of time. So weed management is important because weeds compete with our crops for, for growing space. They compete even for nutrients as well as they can also harbor insect pests as well as problematic diseases. So it's important for us to safeguard our fields. We do not want scenario A there where we see an X, a red X. Scenario B is even worse where we, can, we are failing to even identify if there is a crop or which crop it is. Is it the broadleaf crop there? Or is it a grass crop? Is it maize? We can't even identify. Then even scenario C, closer to home, but not quite there. Scenario D is where we are moving towards, but the ideal scenario is where we can see the ground clean there that we are having no weeds in that field. So weed selection, so weed selection, uh, weed, weed control is important. And besides selection to be guided by the principles that are listed, weed spectrum, stage of control, rotation plan, as well as the cost. You don't want to just be buying uh, expensive chemicals that do not speak to the challenge that you are facing in your field. So it's important for you to also take note of that. And we'll discuss this further as we move into the summer season, as we prepare for the summer growing season. But suffice to say that competition, it reduces the profitability of your green mealy crop. At this point, we'd just like to invite you to send through your questions. We are seeing they are coming through. We'll attend to them at the end of the presentation. Send through questions even through the Facebook page so that we can interact better with you. So in terms of insect pests, you need to understand before you venture into any cropping venture, the problematic insect pests that might arise. So for green millets, as is the case for any maize crop, the challenges include cutworms, white grubs, stock borers, African armyworm, as well as the full armyworm. The full armyworm has been a huge menace over the years, but correct identification of the insect pest in question will give you the correct uh, remedial measures to come with, as well as it will guide you with the time to come in. We do not want to just come in and spray chemicals when we have not detected that we have reached the economic threshold level beyond which economic yield levels will be reached because we want to move with the sustainable development goals which promote uh, the safe use of agrochemicals and the protection of biodiversity in the ecosystem. So the support armyworm, in terms of identification, I'm sure by now most can identify it, but you need to understand that it's easier to control. It's the first insta where we have the newly hatched 
little eggs there. You can just crush the egg masses, the egg masses in white there on the very first picture. Then the small little black headed green larvae, you can come in and spray it with most insecticides it will be controlled. But once you can start counting the four dots on the back, it means it's now a challenge, the Y shape on the, on the front side of the worm, it means it's a challenge for you to control. And some my farmers may even fail to identify the adult mode, which is bringing about this challenge. So it's important for us to know the whole uh, life cycle of any insect pest so that we know the stages that we can best control it. In terms of control, we want to draw much on this. A number of chemicals are available. Uh, the important thing is to alternate chemicals so that you don't end up uh, introducing resistance. And you also need to come in with con um, altern alternating the chemicals with different active ingredients so that they become effective. Agrochemical specialists will assist further on this. So in terms of variety selection, here are some of the tips that we want to talk about. Cob size is important, where large sizable cobs are desired. Kennel set, deep seated kennels are prepared on the market. The dry down rates, this speaks to the selling window that you're going to get. The tolerance to diseases, such as your MSV, the main street virus, which can also be propagated by the, by the, by the leaf whoppers, which we are finding predominantly in the grass that surrounds our field at this time. So it's important for us to also clear our field of any residual grass surrounding the field. And the sweet taste and the roasting quality, as you can see there on the picture, that you can enjoy your, your green mealies if you choose well and you buy the right seed. So they want to, now we to discuss some of the varieties that we have. We just want to first give you a few tips from one of um, uh, uh, the, the seed co um, the personnel is going to tell us about the varieties that are available for green millies. As we move to discuss the variety tips, the different varieties that we have and uh, move towards answering the questions in the chat box. Hello farmers, my name is Fano Senzere. I'm a researcher at Sitco, uh, one of the biggest seed houses in Africa. Uh, I'm here to share a few tips on varietal selection, mainly focusing on green millies production. Uh, in the Sitco maize basket, we have quite a number of varieties which are suitable for green millies, and these are mainly guided by uh, the cob size, uh, the maturity, preferred color of grain. Uh, in the 500 series, we have SC555. Uh, this is a good variety for green millies as it has a big cob and very large grain. It, a farmer is bound to make more profit as the cobs are big and they are preferred by the final consumers. Also, we have in the 600 series, we have 659 with equally good and bigger cobs. Uh, it's very good for green millies as well. We also have SC727 and SC729. These, oh, these are also good for, uh, for green millies and can be grown for as long as you have irrigation uh, anyway in the country. We also have the most preferred uh, variety, which is a yellow one, SC608. Uh, this variety is very good and it sometimes uh, gives you queen cobs, which makes it an advantage to a farmer will be, uh, uh, it's like a double cropping. With 608, I can assure you, you are guaranteed of a good crop. Thank you. So there we have it, a wide range of varieties from Sitco's wide product basket. So at this point, we want to discuss the varieties at a bit of, uh, with a bit of detail. Uh, suffice to say that we'd like to apologize for a slight extension in our presentation for the one hour. Uh, we look forward to be, to be done with this webinar by quarter past one. So in the interest of time, I will share my screen and move to present the varieties that we were speaking to earlier. So in terms of yellow maize, the variety of choice in the yellow maize basket is HC608, a medium maturing variety, good roasting qualities, 
As you can see there, the yellow color, it uh, makes for a good roasting quality. And it also gives us um, good sizable cups, as you have seen in the video that we showed you in the beginning of the presentation. So this is a yellow maize variety of choice. They say the, the dry down rate is medium. So it also gives us a window to sell the produce for a longer period. However, in terms of dry down, you also need to plant a staggered crop so that you can sell for a longer selling window. Moving on to SC513, traditionally and well-known variety having been grown over the years, the variety of choice is fit, but we want to move away from it. We won't know much on it because there are new varieties on the market that have larger sizable crops that have been bred to bring about increased productivity, sweetness, closed tips, as you can see there. And we can also find that they have a drooping effect even when they uh, reach physiological maturity. But for green millies, they are sweet, they have a sizable crop that is desired on the market. And it will also give, uh, they, have also, they also have a wide regional adaptation uh, for diverse environments and a stay green character. In terms of uh, 649, another variety of choice for green millies produces sizable crops, a, a stout variety with a high number of rows and a dry down rate that is good, which is to say it will not dry down very fast, allowing you to sell for a longer period. This is in the medium maturing variety. Then we have the flagship SC659, a variety that raised eyebrows and gave a lot of return, a good returns in terms of profitability for farmers who established it in the summer season for grain. And uh, this variety is quite good. This is sizable crops, as you can see there, our, our, our head breeder, Dr. Mabuyaya holding the signage J is a good variety for you to, to establish SC659 for green millies. Suffice to say that in Burize, we have a farmer who has established 30 hectares and the frost threats did not affect them. They are now selling and they are quite happy with the performance of SC659 on that 30 hectare block that they established for green millies. So it's another wide variety of choice. We also have the SC719 in the late maturing varieties a variety that will give you a sizable cup with closed tips that are desired on the market. And it also gives you um, a good drought and uh, stress tolerance, moisture stress tolerance, well adapted for a wide range of environments with, uh, with characteristics that are desired as well for stay green. Then the SC727, the variety that has been termed Casa Banana at Marim Sika because of the large sized cob that we get. This is another sweet, tasty cob, uh, tasty variety, SC727. It's a variety that you can also establish for green millies. It has a good shelling out percentage, which is to say that the kennels, the kennel set is deep. We have a very small cob and um, the area covered by our grain is large, which is to say that it's a good choice for green millies and it will give you a higher return because you will sell, you'll be selling uh, the number of cobs we'll be selling, like we had from the Barem Sika marketers, that they sell at a dollar for eight in some instances because of the size of the cobs for this particular variety, instead of selling for a dollar or a dozen. Uh, so, this is what we also look at when we talk about green mealy production. So, as we move to wind up, some of the new varieties that were released this season, uh, this year uh, by Sitco, we have SC661, SC657. Suffice to say that we are widening our media maturing basket as a mitigatory measure in the climate uh, 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 to produce climate hard varieties. As we have all rightfully seen, that climate change is a new phenomenon that we are faced with. So, us broadening and introducing varieties that are more adapted to the climate changes, climate but unforeseen uh, weather vagaries that we might come across would be quite important. So, we have SC661 and SC657. This also do well in green millies. Well, last season, the farmers who established it uh, were quite happy with the performance. They say that uh, they produced uh, uh, a sweet, tasty uh, green mealy cobs that are sizable. And as you can see there on the cobs that are being held by our farmers there, the cobs are quite sizable. And this is a desired characteristic of green mealy. So in summary, we have in the 400 series, uh, traditionally we used to have 403, which produced cobs that uh, were not as large and attractive for green mealy production, as well as the dry down window not being as wide. But now we have a new flagship SC419, a new very early maturing hybrid 
which is long, attractive, scope suitable for quick rotations. You want to go in, harvest quickly, or if you want to do a same day planting of different varieties that are going to mature at different periods, it also gives you a longer selling window because they will mature at different times. Then SC513, as you can see there, it's in a lighter shade of gray, just to say that it's a good variety we've had over the years. And we all have an experience with it, having seen it being grown and uh, grown it personally. It's a variety that is good in terms of its performance, but we are now moving to embrace new innovative seed technologies that have been bred for climate smartness. So we have SC529, SC555 in the early maturing varieties, 657 there, and we also have the yellow with a difference, which has been termed the firecracker because it has good roasting qualities, SC608. SC659 is the other one. Then we also have the new flagships that were launched this year, 657 and 661. Then we have in the late maturing varieties, SC719 and 727, which, be, which give us the longest green milli cobs desired on the market. So in conclusion, the take home message, why green milli? As we started our presentation, we gave you a synopsis of the profitability, the profit story. We even gave you a presentation by farmers at Mbarem Sika, by marketers, those, at, 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 those who are marketing these green millies, how profitable it is. And they told us that they can fetch, they are currently fetching $2 to $3 per, um, per, per, per dozen, depending on the period in which they are selling and the size of the crops uh, to which they will be selling. And as the, uh, the selection uh, continues on the market, when they are left with small cobs, they can even fetch a dollar, a dollar fifty, two dollars, which is a good profit. So we are seeing that the return per dollar for green millies can range between a dollar fifty to two dollars, two dollars fifty, uh, depending on the selling window at which you will be selling. And the production cost will range between eight hundred to a thousand US dollars per hectare. Then when to establish it? Soon after winter, and this is the time for you to go in and establish your crop. With what? You need to do it with the right seed. Because what good is it for you to come in and employ good agronomic practices that we were preaching about today and have the wrong seed? You need to start right, get the basics right, start with the right seed for you to get the desired result. And how the good agronomic practices then come into play to unlock the genetic potential of the crops that you will have established. So on that note, I would just like to end by quoting the words again of Akwenumi Adesina, the president, two-time president of the African Development Bank, who said, and I quote, by 2030, the size of the food and agribusiness in Africa will reach a trillion. So if you are thinking of how to make money, that's the sector to be in. So these were the words of a two-time president of the African Development Bank. He can't be wrong. But you need to understand that farming is not a walk in the park. You need to also do your work, do the groundwork, Make sure that you get the basics, get the inputs. Also be prepared to get your hands and your feet dirty. The best medicine to any cropping venture is your farmers, your footprint in the field. You need to be there, constantly monitoring operations so that you become profitable. And lastly, essential as we may be as a sector, we are only essential for as long as we are alive. So let's play our part in preventing the spread of COVID-19 by adhering to all the stipulated regulations and promoting and encouraging all our loved ones to get vaccinated because COVID is real and it's a real menace. At this point, I would like to thank you all for joining us and move into the question and answer segment and apologize again for the lapse in the time that we had stated. Thank you for joining us. So I'll start answering the questions on the chat box and invite more questions to come through through our Facebook page so that we interact more. On our question and answer section, we have been getting some of, we have been giving responses already, but we are going to be answering to the questions that we are seeing there. Please send them through so that this presentation becomes profitable and beneficial to you as you venture into your green milk production window. So the first question we have here from uh, Anonymous, what is the price of uh, the cobs? Uh, 12 cobs, uh, the dozen from the farmer versus the pricing we have had at Mbari. So yes, suffice to say that I think your question wants to speak to, to, to wants to speak about the issues about the farm gate price, where when the farmers uh, are selling from the farm, they might fetch less 
than the price that is being sold at from Barem Sika. But you also need to do a cost benefit analysis of the transportation costs, depending on where you'll be producing your green milly from. Is it uh, more profitable for you to have the buyers coming to buy from the fields? Or is it uh, more profitable for you? Maybe you have a, 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 a small little truck that you can do a delivery with to go and sell by yourself your produce at Mbarem Sika. Is it more profitable that way? But we heard here from Mbarem that they are selling at a dollar. Um, uh, they are selling a dozen for $3, $2, depending on the size of the cob. The large cobs that farmers quickly pick, they are selling at around $2, $53. So it means maybe the farm gate price for those large cobs will be at around $1.50 to $2 or a dollar, depending on the location of the farm in question. Then how do you prevent maize streak from being eaten? Okay. How do you prevent the maize from maize, tree, maize stalks from being eaten by termites? What stage of planting, drying, do you spray for effective control of termites? Thank you very much for that. So termites can be a huge menace, especially at early establishment where they can consume the grain. And later on, as the crop reaches physiological maturity, they may come in to attack the, the grain. But for green mills, especially at termites. So it's important for you to come in with termite control at planting, you can use uh, seed dressing chemicals that have termite control in them, or you can use products that have active ingredients like your uh, fipronil or clopyrifos. They may come in, uh, in, in different trade names, but those are some of the examples of the uh, active ingredients that you can use for termite control. Then the next question we have here, what are the recommended uh, organic fertilizers? Organic fertilizers are good, they also, more environmentally friendly. You need to understand um, the organic fertilizer that you want to use, the NPK ratio that is there in relation to the soil. Uh, you also need to do analysis of the soil, get the organic fertilizers tested. If it's a reputable organic fertilizer, just check on the NPKs that are present in that fertilizer to check if you are providing the required uh, nutrients by the crop for it to grow optimally and also make sure that the crop is not just getting one element because some organic fertilizers might provide nitrogen while others might come in maybe um, with trace elements as opposed to bringing in the whole uh, uh, chain of macro elements and trace elements required by the crop. So get a better understanding of the organic fertilizer and match it to the desired uh, crop requirement. Then uh, there's another question. Can I also use uh, apron star as a seed dresser? Um, apron star, uh, the trade name of the product with two active ingredients. Yes, you can use apron star, but suffice to say that we are not promoting any one product there for seed dressing. You need to do your homework, get more information from agrochemical specialists on other uh, agrochemicals that are available on the market for use. Then we also have a question there from Davidson Udo. Uh, can you comment on the use of manure and the fertilizer? Yes. Uh, organic and inorganic fertilizers is promoted and we encourage it. Uh, just to mention that uh, manure, it depends on the, where the manure is coming from. Is it from, um, uh, is it from cattle? Is it coming from chickens? Is it from the pigs? They all come with different uh, nutrient uh, elements where some might come in with more nitrogen than others, like the, the manure that we get from, from the pigs. They, 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 they give us a bit of fun. Uh, more nutrients than the other manure that we can use. And the, the manure that we get from cattle, we need to also understand that uh, sometimes we need to put in more to get the desired nitrogen level. So you need to understand the, the elements that are coming in the manure that we're using. Otherwise, manure is good. Also need to make sure that it's fully decomposed. We spoke earlier about termites. So termites may also be introduced by the manure if it is active. So you need to make sure that it's fully decomposed so that it doesn't introduce insect pests as well as diseases that can be, uh, be problematic for our crops. Then we also have uh, uh, an additional question from Devson, uh, um, as well as the use of lime in general. Uh, the generality part of your question is what we try to move away from when we are taking farming as a business. We want everyone to analyze their soil, then apply lime that is custom made the recommendations that have been given by the analysis results. So the general recommendations, they are there, yes, but uh, they destroy the whole purpose of us taking farming as a business. We need to analyze and get a better understanding 
the pH level we are sitting at is within the range of 5.5 to 6.5, which is the recommended one for us to get fertilizer use efficiency as well as uh, to promote beneficial microbes exist in the soil that will also add value. So lime, yes, this is the time. Different types of liming agents are available um, on the market, but you need to be guided by soil analysis. And this is the time to lime your soil uh, so that the lime gets ample time to work before the onset of the next season, three to five months desire. Thank you for that question. Then we also have anonymous day. Uh, saying, thank you, Wendy, for the nice presentation. Is it okay in terms of economic and environmental point of view to be at the ideal picture about weed control? Uh, I think picture D is good for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So the ideal scenario will come into play when you have um, done your land preparation, maybe using the conventional uh, way of doing uh, your farming, and also you're coming in with uh, the use of herbicides. Suffice to say that nowadays, there are more environmentally friendly chemicals available on the market for, for use if you, are, if you want to be environmentally cautious of what you are using. But also you can come in with a scenario where you're putting in mulch in, the, in between the lines. And also mulch will suffocate the weeds. So there is no one size fits all. There are different ways to get to one destination. So the important thing for you to take note of is that you want a weed-free seedbed. Whether we are employing uh, conventional methods of doing it or conservation methods of doing it, we need to make sure that our environment is also safeguarded, but our crop doesn't suffer in the same vein. Thank you very much for bringing that up. It's an important point. Environmentally conscious uh, farming is what we are advocating for. Then we have... Um, Uh, anonymous here. Uh, I am having a rodent problem. How best can I deal with it? They are digging up and eating the seed of uh, on emergence. In most cases, uh, uh, those are moles that usually go into a that, that usually have a tendency of digging up and uh, following through. So the important thing is to look for is look for the uh, the mole hills that will be in the field. And um, some farmers might come in with uh, fumar force or gas toxin tablets that they throw into the tunnels and then they cover so that that gas can move through the tunnels and kill or destroy them. These are some of the things that some farmers are doing, but agrochemical specialists can also assist. Then we have Gertrude Chimbindi. Hi, Wendy. I produce one hectare of green leaves under drip irrigation during the summer season. Can frost be managed when using drip irrigation? Or is overhead irrigation better suited? Thank you very much for that. Um, summer season uh, frost. So frost would have been, I think, at the second part of your, your, your question, where frost is most dominant in winter. So drip irrigation, because it's irrigation, it's irrigating the ground and not necessarily irrigating and uh, producing water that is going on the leaves. Some farmers may argue that in terms of mitigation, the it doesn't mitigate as much as uh, overhead because overhead is put, putting water on, on the leaf surface, which also helps in uh, providing a, a cover. If you are going to irrigate at periods when frost is prone, maybe in early hours of the, of, of the morning, when we are most at risk for frost overhead, would be better suited than drip. But uh, drip also comes in with its advantages outside of the periods of frost. It also manages issues to do with um, Water use efficiency is more efficient. It's only directing water to a localized environment. And it also is cost effective in that sense. And it also reduces the incidence of diseases. So you need to measure, depending on whether or not you're doing it in summer or in winter, which irrigation method will give you uh, more benefits. Then we also have uh, a question here from Mukai Shoko before we get our last question from uh, Christine Tizana. Uh, Mukai is asking, um, thank you for the detailed presentation. Are you going to share this presentation for reference during production? Thank you very much, uh, Mukai Shoko. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time to go through this presentation with us. And yes, once we have been recording this presentation and we'll be sharing the link for you to constantly refer and we are available for further engagement. You will be sharing the video on YouTube so that you can uh, constantly refer to it and we have agronomists uh, 
uh, across the country, where you can also engage for further engagement on, on green milli production. And we are also available to assist at all levels of production to add value in your farming enterprise. Because at, at Citgo, we believe in providing solutions to the farmer. Then we have our last question there from Christine Chizana. What variety can I grow for silage? Thank you so much, Christine. Um, uh, suffice to say, how are you? How is your crop? How are your cropping ventures? And uh, I do hope you are doing well. I've been to, to your farm a couple of times and I uh, would just like to say you're doing well. So for silage, we encourage farmers to grow SC719. Uh, it's a bulky leafy variety with a stay green character and it is good for, for, for silage yields. Where in silage yield, we want yield of above 50 tons because here we are harvesting everything, the stalks, the leaves, the grains. So a yield of above 50 tons. And uh, just to mention that it's uh, at, at, at Red Den, uh, Kefalos and Beatrice, they have reached 70 tons on their silage yield with 719. So you can also do 727 and the other varieties in the 600 series for, for silage, uh, 659 and 649, they also give us uh, good stage green characters and 661. Uh, in bulky leafy uh, traits that are desired for silage. And if you want a quick rotation, triple five is also there, unlike the traditional early maturing varieties or the other, any other early maturing varieties on the market, it is bulky, leafy, and it's quite tall. So this will also add on the silage yield. Thank you very much for your question. So at this point, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and uh, wish you all a productive and profitable green milli production window. My time is exactly quarter past two, and I would like to thank you for joining us and encourage future engagement. Have a good day.